Harry It's early Monday morning, 4 a.m. Take a phone from Family Trouble 70. Go out of yelling. Uh, the other person supposedly hung up the phone. The police respond to a 911 call. Realize it says she has a restraining order and he's climbing in the window. Family Trouble. One of over 200 domestic disputes the cops in this precinct see each month. What are you doing, Don? You called me over here. So what? You're supposed to stay away. These officers are going to arrest this man for violating his restraining order. He was trying to break into the home where his ex-girlfriend lives with their son. Why are you doing this? Hey, Daddy, how do we do it? Right? Oh, yeah. After a long night of arguing, she finally called the police. You gotta take it, pal. He'll spend the night in jail. She can fall asleep without fear, knowing he won't be coming back. But what about their three-year-old son? What are his fears? What is he feeling? Time and time again, he has watched his parents come to blows. His father spent six months in jail for assaulting his mother. And the police have been called to his home 20 times in the last year. How much more can you take? How does a little boy begin to understand what he's witnessed? And what will happen to him and the millions of children just like him? I love my mommy and my daddy. Yeah. Children living with domestic violence. I was up downstairs. I was in my room. And what did you hear? Fighting. He was bad. He was bad? Was he bad to you? No, he was bad to you. He said he'll kill my mom first and then he'll kill us. I'm always afraid of him because you know what? He's always bad to my mom and he always, he always makes her sick. Like veterans of war, all of these children have witnessed torture and terrorism. But their war zone is not in some far off country. It's in their own homes. My mother was screaming, she was crying. It was in this home, almost a year ago, that Betsy Pagan's children woke to the terrifying screams of their mother pleading for her life. He was stabbing me. He was telling me, die. I hate you. Why did you leave me? I hate you. I hate you. I was like, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. That's when the kids heard me. You had been asleep. And what did you hear? Screams. When I went in, the bed was bloody, and the, the rug had blood on it. He was on top of my mother, and he was just stabbing her. What did you do then? I saw the blood, so I called my mom. Jean, Marino, and Betsa had seen their mother and their stepfather fight and argue for years. They were all relieved when their mother finally broke up with him. No one thought he would try to kill her. I was covered with blood. I, I had lost so much blood. And that's when I saw Betsa. She jumped on him from the back, and she pulled him off from me and threw him on the floor. I was, like, saying, oh, my God, please don't let her die. And she was already on top of me with her body, covering mine to save me. It was like, please, uh, she was like, please don't kill my mommy. Please don't do this to my mommy. And when I saw he was ready to come and stab her, I just pushed her out the way. And that's when he stabbed me right on my chest. You punctured a lung too, didn't you? You got a stab wound in the heart? Yeah. Betsy Pagan counted 18 stab wounds on her body. She spent eight months recuperating at the Casa Mirna shelter for battered women. Her ex-boyfriend is in prison for attempted murder. Oh, love you, big man. But her children still don't feel safe. The memory of that night haunts them. They must be deeply scarred by this and worried about you. Yes, they are. And what are some of the effects? They woke up at night and go in my bed and he used to shake me up. Mom, Mom, you okay? to see if I was breathing. Because they were worried. Sometimes I woke up and I had my kids with their head in my heart to hear if I was, you know, to see if I was alive or something. If you've seen something terrifying happen to a parent or a loved one, you are going to carry with you a fear that it will happen again.
Betsy McAllister Groves is a therapist who runs the Child Witness to Violence Project at Boston City Hospital. Children may become more distractible, more anxious, sometimes more aggressive. We also see behavioral changes in the other direction, that children may become more passive, may look depressed, may look preoccupied, may not play spontaneously anymore. We've seen sleep disturbances in children. Children who witness a terrifying event have trouble sleeping. They may have nightmares. They may wake frequently at night. Experts agree that all of these symptoms are associated with post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's a psychiatric disorder more commonly used to diagnose soldiers in combat. And just like veterans of war, witnessing domestic violence evokes terror, anxiety, and flashbacks in these children. I know it's a tough thing to, to think about, but do you think you'll ever be able to forget about it? No. You think it'll always be with you? Sometimes when I'm doing nothing, just like laying down or just sitting down watching TV or something like that, it just pops in my mind. I see like his face and like I see him like stabbing my mother and me jumping on him, pushing him. If I don't call 911, my mother should be dead. If he hadn't called 911, his mother would have died. Those thoughts still terrorize nine-year-old Jean. And the youngest, Lulu, won't even speak about what she witnessed that night. All of the children received counseling at the battered women's shelter. And the boys are continuing therapy in school. They say they are healing. The counselor in my school is helping me take, it, take it that out of my mind. Why would it be bad if it got back to your mind? You'll be dreaming about it. <sighs> the fear of dreams turning into nightmares makes bedtime really difficult for children who have been exposed to domestic violence. Two-year-old Genesis screams like this every night. She and her four siblings all witnessed their father's violent behavior for years. He's in jail now for going after their mother with a machete. But it is five-year-old Pedro's aggressive behavior that worries his mother the most. He's been kicked out of one school, has been involved in street fights, and seriously injured a child with a brick. He is currently being treated at the Child Witness to Violence Project. Children who are too young or too afraid to talk about their fears are encouraged to use play and art therapy to express themselves in order to heal. I, I want to be a good daddy. Four-year-old Navneet drew this picture of a monster for his counselors. He says the monster is his father, and Navneet is afraid he'll kill the family with the knife he's holding. He says it reminds him of the loud and bumpy sounds he heard one night. I thought that was, that was a monster, and that was a monster noise, I thought. But that wasn't, that was my dad. He has wild monster noises. They just a bad attitude at people. Navneet's eight-year-old sister, Jasmine, drew this. Her counselor says her thoughts are red because they symbolize violence. But the knife has a window in it, showing a way out. I'm afraid that he might find us someday and kill us. After 11 years in a violent marriage, Bupinder Kaur fled with her three children. They are now in hiding. But the judge is forcing the children to have supervised visits with their father once a week at a neutral location. I think my father is not very nice. He's abusive. I don't want to see him. And what I think is, like, why does he have to be that way? Why can't he be like everyone else? Until you read the girls' Christmas lists, you really can't understand the loss of innocence for these children. Jasmine's top three wishes are to never see her father again, never in her lifetime. And the request that most little girls make, like a plea for more Barbie dolls, is listed far below. Sumit talks about how she used to feel lying in bed at night, listening to her parents fighting. Like, I feel like in my throat I'd feel sick, and I'd feel like... My heart's in my mouth. 
if I'm eating it, and then I'll die. That's what I used to think. It's hard to hear the stories from children. It's hard to know that our youngest children live sometimes with such danger and such chaos. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Betsa Pagan just celebrated her 13th birthday. Make a wish. Good one. Betsa told us that she feels good because she knows she's safe now. But she also feels bad because of what she had to go through. Things like that just don't go away so easily, she said. I love you. And later that night, her brother Marino proved that to be true. Marino, what's going on, baby? When his dreams hey. once again woke him. Hey, remember? Remember what I always say to you? Hmm? No? We are safe here. It's nothing is going to happen to us. Okay? It's over. It's over. All right? Okay, honey? Our next speaker, Ms. Pamela Albers, she is with Crescent House and does a lot of work with uh, families with domestic violence as an issue and particularly working with the children. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Hello! <laughs> Uh, I'm going to use this next, this time. Last time I spoke, uh, it was like, hello, we can't hear you. So um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm a, an LCSW with Crescent House, and we're a domestic violence program under Catholic Charities uh, in New Orleans. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I get you guys after lunch. That's going to be fun. How many carbs did you have? Lots, cookies, brownies, pasta? Love it. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, you barely missed my pink tutu and cowboy hat. Okay, because I do have those in the trunk of my car, but I, I don't know you guys, so I didn't wear them. Um, I, I do stress management play shops, and I'm doing that after this, and I will need my own play shop. But uh, I dress up in a tutu, and at 55, that's a real stretch, but it works. It works for me, okay? And uh, people are not scared, even though they probably should be. Uh, so this is what we're going to do today. You get me for two whole hours if you can stand it. Okay, if you nod off, if you leave, that's okay, I'm not insulted. Um, I would love it if you raise your hands and ask questions because truly you will be tired of me in two hours. I promise you, you will. Um, so this is what I'm talking about today. Uh, my specialty, so to speak, is domestic violence. I work with adults and children. Uh, I work with a lot of adolescents and we have a lot of mental health issues as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about that, what it looks like, what domestic violence looks like. It, the definition is easy, but the way it plays out in real life is really, really uh, kind of complex. You know, so we're going to do that today. Um, there's some handouts that you've got. I have played with this PowerPoint. If you have a copy of it, it's not the same, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, but uh, I, I added stuff, and if I have your email address, I'll be very happy to email this one to you. Um, but the, the handouts that you have are some different power and control wheels, and they're PDFs, which means I couldn't copy them to put them in my PowerPoint. So I had to give you real copies. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna get started. Okay, uh, just a little purpose of this whole deal. It's just to understand the the overlap between child mental health and domestic violence. And uh, until I started doing this work about five and a half years ago, I never thought about it. You know, I didn't think about uh, the implications, even though that is the way I grew up. I grew up in a violent home. And you know, even at my tender age of 50, when I decided to be a social worker, it still hadn't dawned on me, you know. So um, we're going to look at that, and it makes total sense to me now, all right. Uh, just to understand the basics of domestic violence, uh, if you've never really thought about the definition of it, you're going to have a solid definition today. Uh, the perception of violence by the child, not only of the person perpetrating the violence, but of the person who is receiving it, like the mom. 
Okay, and kids have all kinds of funny ideas about mom when they're living with violence in the home. And then just some best practices. This is part of the new stuff I added. So uh, y'all are the first ones to hear it. I'm so excited. Okay, and I'm also a little bit nervous. Um, so let's look at, these are just the basics, all right? And I know you can read it up here, but I, I'm curious from you guys, uh, how would you define domestic violence? You can either yell or raise your hand. It doesn't matter, you know? What does it look like to you? How do you perceive it? Perceive it as control, one person attempting to control another. Absolutely, it's all about control. That is at the center of domestic violence. It's all about power and control. Okay, anybody else? I think of it as yelling, screaming, cursing. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very verbal part of the abuse, right. But is it limited to yelling and screaming? No. What else do you get with it? Physical, emotional, right. Sexual, absolutely. Financial, oh yeah, oh if I had a prize you'd get one. So don't. But yeah, a lot of people don't think about the financial end of that, but for a battered woman to, to leave her abuser if and when she chooses to, you need money. You, you really do. It's hard to find somebody to pay your rent. And if you do, let me know who it is because I want to know them. Okay, my rent's outrageous in New Orleans after the hurricane. It stinks. But yeah, so financial. You need money. You need money for childcare, gas, clothes, everything. Okay, so what else does it look like? Yes, ma'am. form of terrorizing. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and, and for generations, the government sanctioned it. Well, it, it's all about, it's domestic terrorism is what it is. And you know, when, um, when, it was first decided that a battered woman could be diagnosed with PTSD. Y'all know what PTSD is? It's post-traumatic stress disorder. That was first designated for military men coming back from the Vietnam War, right? Well, so these great minds and all their great thinking decided that that could be applied to a battered woman, and with good reason, because it is a form of terrorism, and she's very afraid. She's afraid for her life every single day. Okay, so that's, that's all really good, and you guys got most of it or all of it. But it's all of those things. There's the slapping, the kicking, the punching, the baseball bats, the bleach, the gasoline, stealing the car, stealing the money, stealing the children, kidnapping. Okay, there's all of those things. And if you're somebody living in the middle of that, it's incredibly difficult, not only to get your mind wrapped around it, but to figure out what you're gonna do. Not only to protect yourself, but to protect your kids. Okay, it's any relationship. When domestic violence was first defined for what it is, it was thought that domestic violence only occurred between two people and they were married. Okay, well now we know that that's not entirely true. It can occur between any two people in any intimate relationship, married or not, single or not, dating or not, gay or straight, doesn't matter what color, what race, what socioeconomic group you're in, it could be anybody. Your mother, your sister, your daughter, your best friend, your grandma, grandma's grandma, it could be anybody. Okay, so it's not limited, it's an equal opportunity perpetrator. Yep, not our best friend though. Okay, um, okay you've got a power and control wheel that matches this one. Okay, and it's way, way too hard to read up here, although this is pretty big. That's great. Okay, so if you look at this, this is everything that we just talked about. This is in, and it makes up that big, hairy cycle of violence, okay? And I just think of this as a tire on your car, okay? And you know that part in the middle of your tire with all the lug nuts and stuff, right? That's what keeps your tire on the car? Well, if you took the lug nuts off of that tire, it would fall off, right, and it wouldn't work anymore? Okay, I know that sounds weird, but really, if you consider the power and control part of this relationship as those lug nuts that hold the relationship together, you get rid of that and the whole thing falls apart. Because if I'm not afraid of you, it doesn't matter what you say, how much you intimidate me, or how much you threaten me, if I'm not concerned about you and if I'm not afraid of you, it doesn't work. Okay, so you take the power and control away and you t the relationship falls apart, or at least the, the violent part of it does. So using children is one of the most powerful ways to, an abu to abuse a partner, which is, and I'm pointing this one out because we're really talking about kids today. But you know, a mother who is trying to protect her children will do just about anything to protect those children. All right, so we're, we're just gonna kinda go past this for right now. 
Okay, so here's a few numbers, you know, for those of you in the, the crowd who really love numbers. I really don't love numbers, but these are uh, something that you need to know. Um, females under the age of 30 and between the ages of 41 and 54, most vulnerable to domestic violence. So I'm asking you, why do you think that is? Why those ages and not other ages? What are you doing when you're under the age of 30? You're what? Well, you don't know yourself. That's a very good point. You're having children. Aren't you dating? You could be dating, you know, because, I mean, think of this. Under the age of 30 includes being a teenager, right? You're dating. You're just starting out. You're just meeting people. You're just trying to figure out who you are. It's real easy to fall in L-O-V-E. Okay, I'm in love, and oh, that means so many great things. I love him. He loves me, and the life is good. Life is great. Okay, but you see, texting you 55 times a minute is not love. Mm -mm, that's talking. Okay, and that's what I try and help our teenagers especially understand. If you're getting 600 instant messages a day, mmm, no. First, mom is going to be mad because that's going to be quite a bill. And, and that's really that stalking and possessive behavior. And, and if you've never thought about it from that perspective, you know, you just don't know. All right, so under 30, you're just starting to know yourself, you're starting to date, you're establishing your career, your future, who you're going to be, and you'll wind up with some fella who decides your life is going to be my life and what I say it's going to be. Okay, and if you're in L-O-V-E, you're going to do exactly what he says, at least for a little bit. Okay, now between 41 and 54, what are you doing then? Oh, yeah, I had empty nest syndrome, and it was delightful. <laughs> Loved the child, but so glad when she got her own place. Okay, I was the best empty nester around. Baby, it was wonderful. Okay, so, so the kids are leaving. What else are you doing, maybe? You could be retiring. Yeah, you really could be. I want to be that person. I do, yeah, but not there yet. Okay, what else are you doing? You could be re-entering the dating pool. You really could. Okay, see, that's a pool I don't want to go into. But you could be. You, you, could, be, um, you could be having all kinds of big life changes in that part of your, your life. All right, so if part of that change includes a divorce and you're feeling like, oh, my gosh, I've screwed up a marriage. I've, I've done all kinds of terrible things. Oh, and now Mr. Wonderful comes along and I'm in big girl L-O-V-E. Okay, you're going to hook up and it happens all the time and it may not be a good relationship. Okay, so you're, these two periods in a, a person's lifetime are very vulnerable. There's lots of lifestyle and life changes going on. And so you add a, a violent relationship into that and it gets really, really complicated. Okay, and, and for us at Crescent House, these are exactly the ages that we see. This is where most of our clientele fall. Now, I do have to add that in the past six months, we've seen uh, a significant increase in the number of women over 65 years old. Our oldest client is 79. We love her. She is so sweet. She is so, and honey, don't get on the wrong end of her. No, 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 no. And, and at 79, she is not going to leave a marriage of 65 years. She's not going to do it. So we, we give her support. We give her encouragement. We help her out with a safety plan. And, and she is sticking right where she is. But she knows she can come to us for, you know, a little counseling, a dinner, you know. Uh, every once in a while, she wants to know if we have some sherry to go with dinner. And I was like, no, darling, we just can't do that part. But so, and that's how our, our age groups are changing. We're also getting, I think last week, um, we probably got phone calls at least a half a dozen times from uh, assisted living. Now, these are the, not really assisted living, but these are the folks who go into the home and they do the in-home health care. Okay, and they're wanting to know, where can my client go? She's 68 years old. She needs me to be, to be able to come and see her, and her husband is terribly abusive. Oh, my God, what do you think I'm saying? I'm like, I don't know. 
you know, because the, the health care system, the, um, the nursing home system, assisted living, even the shelter system, we are so unprepared for the baby boomers who are going to need that care in those agencies, in those facilities. We just don't know what we're going to do yet. Yes, ma'am. Are you finding that the abuse at this age level has been going on for a long time? Or is it just new abuse? Oh, that's such a good question. Is the abuser, is the abuser somebody who, assuming it's a man, mm -hmm. is having some kind of problem, physical and mental problem, causing him mm -hmm. to become an abuser, or is it long term? Well, it's all of that and, and, and none of it. Um, what we are um, seeing is you can get two things. You have, we call it abuse that's always been there, and it's just grown old along with the relationship. Okay, it's always been there, and it gets worse over time. Sometimes it takes 65 years, but it does get worse. And for this one particular person, there is dementia going on now with him. So the abuse that he had going on already is just so much worse because now he's got early onset dementia, which does not help at all. Okay, Or what you have is a 55-year-old woman. Aren't they calling them cougars now? Yeah. Okay, I think I want to be one. They're so cute. Okay, really not. No, no. Um, <laughs> no. Dating scares me. It does. Okay, so you have a 55-year-old woman. She's got resources. She's got assets. She's going along and she falls in love with a 30 year old man okay what does he want her resources oh yes indeed and then he turns out to be not such a nice man okay so it could be one or the other but yes especially with older ages there can definitely be some mental health issues that possibly weren't there before and then you have a whole new ball game okay that's a very very good point Okay, so we're going to move on. Holy mackerel. Okay, so let's look at the kids. Every year, there's about 7 to 14 million children exposed to violence. That's a big range, isn't it? Well, the reason for that is all about reporting. Okay, if it doesn't get reported as child abuse or if it's not reported as having domestic violence in the home, we don't know. You know, we only know what we get reports on. So it is a huge range. 90% of non-abusive parents say they think their kids don't, go what's go don't know what's going on in the home. Well, and then you look down. Uh, oh, I don't have that number here. 95% of kids can tell you exactly what's going on. They know what daddy said, what he did, what mama was wearing, and how much ice it took to help the swelling on her eye go down. Okay, they know exactly what's going on. Um, Let's look at the ages, okay? 45% of the kids in violent homes are zero to five years. So we're talking about a mom trying to care for an infant while she's trying to keep herself safe. Okay, so think of that. 35% is six to 11 years, and 17% is 12 to 17 years. Okay, so I mean, there's a huge disproportion of zero to five years. And one of the things that happens in a relationship, if there was violence in it before she was pregnant, what do you think happens after she has the baby? Yes, it does. And why do you think that happens? Too much attention. Too much attention on the child. Yeah, he's no longer center of attention. What's that? It would be very hard for her to leave the baby. Well, it does get a whole lot more complicated when there's a baby. Yes, it does. And that's one of the reasons that the woman will stay behind. It's that or be in a homeless shelter with my child because quite often, well, let's see, 65% of those in homeless shelters are children. 65%. And then you have the moms after that. The, one of the biggest reasons for a woman to become homeless is domestic violence. All right. First exposure to violence is usually younger than three years. At 61% of those kids. Okay. So here's some root causes. These are myths. The victim provoked the abuse. Isn't that charming? I hear that all the time. What'd you do? Did you not have dinner ready? Did you wear that makeup that he doesn't like you to wear? Did you not put gas in the car? And I hear that from mothers when they talk to me. I have told her and told her how to keep her husband happy. And then you talk to mama, and mama lived with it for 40 years. So if mama did it, she figures a child can do it, or her daughter can do it. Okay? Abuse is an anger problem. I'm very curious about what y'all think. Is it anger? No. <gasps> I love you. It's not anger. What is it? Y'all all get gold stars. I love you. Yeah, it's not anger. It looks like anger. It looks like what we think of as anger. The yelling, hit, hitting, slapping, all of that stuff. 
okay? But really, lots and lots of angry people don't abuse other people, right? So this is not about anger. It's all about power and control. Oh, the victim likes it. Okay, see, that's just not right. Okay, how many got up this morning and said, oh, I want to be beat up today? Anybody? Please don't raise your hand. Okay, no, that doesn't happen. The woman being abused is thinking every day about how to get out. This is not about liking. Okay, although what she will tell you is, I don't want to necessarily leave my partner. I don't want a divorce. I don't want his money. I'll even share custody of the kids with him. I'll stay with him if he'll just stop what he's doing. I've been with him 25 years, lady. I don't want to leave him. I just want him to stop hurting me. Okay, that's what they're saying. Okay, substance abuse. Now, y'all watch this. Look at the word. Causes violence. What do you think? Okay, so you have all the answers. Did you peek at my notes? No, I'm teasing you. I'm te oh, yay! Okay, see, so you know. Okay, you can answer anything else. No, I'm kidding. Well, and you're right. It, it doesn't cause it. Okay? Domestic violence does not cause... I'm sorry. Mm -mm. Alcohol does not cause domestic violence. Power and control does. But what does alcohol do to you? Yeah, yeah, it lowers your inhibitions, right? Okay, here's my story. Okay, those of you who have seen me before have heard this before. I am a lot more likely to dance naked if I've been drinking. I have never drunk, I've never danced naked. I just never have. Okay? <laughs> just, no. Not even in my pink tutu. Mm -mm. So, so it does. It, it, it lowers your inhibitions. It lowers your ability to make a good decision. You do things you would not ordinarily do if you are influenced by a substance, alcohol or drugs. That's just going to happen. Okay? Um, victims are helpless and don't want out of a violent relationship. Do y'all buy that for a minute? Is she helpless? She might feel helpless. And many women come to me and say, I feel like nobody is helping me and I feel powerless to do anything. So we're all about empowerment. We start showing them how we can give them support and how they can take control. And if you want out, we can help you get out. If you want to stay in, we'll help you stay safe while you're in it. It's a lovely thing. Okay, here's some facts. The causes, it's a combination. It's not any one thing. It's cultural, it's social. It's environmental, it's psychological, okay? It's all of those. It's reinforced by our culture, okay? It really is. And when I go out and do training with different people, I hear different things and go, wow, it really is still enforced by what we think and by the way we raise our children. Um, the, the guy who's out there doing the abusing, his peers are supporting him, okay? He's, he might be the guy who's out there in the bar on a Friday night He's talking about how I show my woman who's boss, you know. <laughs> and he's walking around in his big cowboy boots and his big hat, you know. And his friends are going, yeah, yeah, I bet you did. You know, what'd she do this time? You know, what'd you do to her? And they're supporting him. All right. There's a, there's a, bless you, baby. There's a tolerance for violence that goes along with this. And, you know, I was watching, I don't really like TV so much, but I do watch kind of what the teenagers and the kids watch because I want to see what they're seeing. And it's crazy, some of this stuff, okay? What you're seeing on TV and in the music and, and, and just everywhere, they're inundated with these messages to a point that where I even kind of block it out and I have to pull myself back and go, wait, whoa, what was that? You know, and I'm like the one in my own living room yelling at the cat going, did you see that? You know, <laughs> and the cat's going, at what? You know, but I do, I get incredibly upset at media and advertising and music and it's what our kids hear all the time. And adults hear it too, you know, and we respond to it. Um, there are many people who still believe that domestic violence is a private issue and I am just not going to get involved. Well, what I say is, well, you don't have to get yourself hurt, but calling the police could save somebody's life. Would you be willing to do that? You know, most people will do that, okay? And I have a few pieces of artwork thrown in here. There is an art project out of um, Wisconsin, and it was in a domestic violence shelter, and some art therapists came in, and they helped the kids kind of process their anger and grief and rage and everything else about what they had seen in their home. So when you see these little pieces of art, that is what this project is. That's what the pieces are from. So this is a, a mommy and the daddy, and I think this was a four-year-old. 
okay, who drew this? I mean, you get it right there. You don't even need any words about what these kids are seeing. And remember, the moms are saying, oh, the kids don't know. They don't know anything. They're in bed when this happens. Yeah, but kids hide on stairways and they hide in hallways. Okay. So why women feel they have to stay? You got a whole long list of stuff. Fear? She's afraid she's going to die. Because the most uh, dangerous time for a woman in a violent relationship is when she's leaving. Okay? Women die when they're leaving. If they're going to die, that's when it happens. Of the women who leave a violent relationship and they're killed doing so, 75% die as they're leaving. Okay? So that's a, a pretty significant number. Um, I don't know if you guys read the paper, the, the shooting, the homicides down in Holden, Louisiana over the weekend. Y'all read that? That lady had a restraining order. They had been having problems, okay? He, they had separated. I don't know how long they had been separated, but he chose to kill her after they had separated. Okay? Um, there's guilt, there's shame, isolation. Truly, women very often are kept from having friends. You can't see your mama, your daddy, your sister, your brother, grandma, nobody, because they don't understand me. And if they don't understand me, they don't get to be in our, our family. Okay? So she feels isolated, even if she's not really. There are so many women, when I ask them, who do you have who you can turn to in an emergency who would help you no matter what time of day or night or when it was? And so many women say, I don't have anybody. And whether it's really true or not, they believe it's true. So, you know, if they believe it, we have to work with that and overcome that. Um, there's hope. What do you think they're hoping for? For change. said change. Yeah, change. Yep, yep. Either I will be a wonderful wife, I'll change me, and then he'll respond to that change, or I'll change him. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I could change him? You know, I've changed him. He has found God. You know, all kinds of things is what they say, and that's what they hope. The biggest hope is the violence will just stop. Okay? And here's the thing, it doesn't. All right? Social values, some cultural hurdles. Um, we don't see at Crescent House too many people from uh, the Asian American community because it's a very closed, close-knit community. And if there is violence in their community, and we know there is, but they don't tell us about it, they take care of it within their community. And their cultural perspective is, we just don't talk about it. Okay, and we'll, we'll, everything will be fine. Just be a good wife. And, and that's great until somebody dies. You know, so we try really hard to connect with that community. So we've given a church down in um, the not, oh, let's see, New Orleans East. We've given a church our information, and, and they've tried to refer. But really, it's a cultural hurdle that we're still trying to jump over. Okay? It's really important that we stop asking why women stay and just start asking why batterers abuse and why we allow it. Okay, um, my mother is a breast cancer survivor, so I'm totally behind research and dollars and every pink thing in the world to support breast cancer research. Okay, and if we had all of that stuff for domestic violence, we would raise awareness because really this is one of the few things left in this world besides child sexual abuse, which I also talk about, that people don't want to talk about. I have a hard time getting people to stay in front of me and talk to me because it, it's a tough issue, okay? And, and so we, do, we have to question our values. We have to question what we see on TV, what we hear on the radio, and what our kids are exposed to. Our kids really are the silent witnesses to domestic violence. I was silent for so long. My dad, um, my dad died when I was uh, 16, and until then I had been silent. And my mother was silent until last year and uh, I, I did a, an honor for my mother at a domestic violence rally. And my mom's still living, she's 86. And I called her, I said, Mama, is this okay with you? Can I tell your story about what happened to us when we were kids? She's like, well now, why would you wanna do that? I'm like, because you were a very brave woman and you were doing things that you just intrinsically knew long before there were battered women's shelters, battered women's programs, or anybody to tell you what to do. You did everything right. She's like, oh, well, if you really want to, I guess that would be okay. You know, she's so sweet. So anyway, that, that's just my mom. 
So here's how it looks to kids, all right? Imagine what children are exposed to. All right, they see it, hear it, they hear the fists when they hit the flesh, they hear the screaming, the cursing, the threatening, they hear the objects hitting the wall, they see the holes in the wall, they see mama's black eye. Now can you imagine being a four-year-old and trying to process that in a little world that's never seen anything like that? Hmm, but that's what kids are doing every day. All right, so we're gonna go into, CPS is OCS, okay? I just kinda did a cut and paste on this one. All right, in two states. All right, and if you're really curious about what the states are, you can go to vonnet.org and see the whole research project. It's very, very good. But 41 to 43 percent of cases resulted in a critical injury or death to a child. Okay, that's like almost half of their cases. Okay, and the domestic violence was not even really a known issue at first. Okay, it was other stuff the, the neighbors were reporting like the kids weren't weren't dressed It looked like they hadn't been fed the teachers were reporting that they were coming to school dirty You know so the domestic violence started coming out later All right So we already did this the caretakers really believe that, that the kids are not aware I already said 95% can provide real real details all right, and here's the exposure that they have. They hear it, they see it, and maybe they're even forced to participate. Okay, and the aftermath. The aftermath is like help a mom with an ice pack, helping her clean up the blood on the floor. You know, that could be something that maybe a 12-year-old is helping mama do. You know, and mom's trying not to cry, and the kids totally get it, and, and so that's what they're dealing with. Being used as a spy, what do you think that's all about? How do you use a kid in your own house as a spy? Well, where the abuser could be, and how about the person who's being abused? Yeah. <gasps> Tell me what mom is doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What else? Maybe what she's wearing. How much? Uh huh. Who's she with? Oh my gosh, yeah. Because abusive partners are incredibly jealous. They're so afraid you're gonna run off with somebody else. Well, you know, maybe I wouldn't if you'd stop beating the daylights out of me. That fear would kind of disappear for you. You know, so there's the jealousy, there's the insecurities. Um, it is very much about power and control and now the kids are involved. And let me tell you what, for a kid who's afraid of this person, they'll do it just because they figure it's safer to tell you than to not tell you. Even though I might get mama in trouble, I don't know what's going to happen to all of us if I don't tell you something. So I used to just lie. You know, it was perfect. I could lie like a rug. You know, I could. Uh, being used as a pawn, okay? This is all about child custody or a kidnapping. And let's say you're um, an American woman married to somebody from a foreign country. You could disappear with your children to that country. You'd never see him again. We've seen that in the news. It's been in books and movies, too. Okay? Being injured while holding your baby. We have seen and have heard about so many infants who have either been killed or they've been severely injured while mom is trying to shield them from the blows that the perpetrator is giving to her, and she's afraid the baby's going to get injured. You know, so um, we've heard of babies being used as a baseball bat on the mom, baby wound up with a broken pelvis, okay? Dang it, just kind of makes sure, gives you a little bit of a, a breath back. Um, being a victim of collusion or silence, this was our family's thing, we just didn't talk about it. Oh, everything's fine. See my smile? Everything's fine. It was part of the lying and the denial, but that's all you know how to do. If you're afraid to talk about it, you just say everything's fine. Okay, all right. Um, so we're gonna look at the three different categories of the effects on kids that this has, and some of them we're gonna go into a little bit more detail on because I found some really great new research that, that was really interesting. Okay, so we're gonna look at kids, little infants, okay? This is a long list of stuff and how infants are affected when there's violence in the home. But before we hit this part, I, I just wanted to mention, I. I read something uh, a few, well, hmm, it's probably close to a year ago now, and it's all about the way the brain development of an unborn child is affected 
when the mother who's carrying this baby is being beaten or otherwise abused while she's pregnant. Now you know what affects the mother affects the unborn child, right? Okay, alcohol, cigarettes, too much chocolate, and Fritos. I know about the Fritos, uh-huh. Blew up like a toad, it was all the salt. <laughs> but my daughter loves Fritos, okay? I said, mm-hmm, there's a good reason you like Fritos. All right, so what affects the mother affects the child. If the, what happens is, when you're under a great deal of stress, okay, there's cortisol in your body, it's just a, some kind of chemical, and there's a rise in cortisol when you're under stress. Okay, this rise in cortisol, causes anxiety in the fetus, okay, and does all kinds of things to the fetus. Well, in the end, it affects brain development. All right, so when this little baby is born, what they're finding is, in the fetus, it's having symptoms of fetal alcohol syndrome. And y'all know what symptoms are of that. You've got, uh, it's hard to console them, irritable, cranky, uh, they have fear, they withdraw, they're depressed. Oh, look at all those symptoms. Okay, a lot of the same stuff. So, and the reason they did that research is because they were looking at that and they said, oh, we're seeing all these mothers with these babies who are being born. It looks like they have fetal alcohol syndrome, but these moms didn't drink. So when they started looking at that one thing that connected all the mothers, they were abused while they were pregnant. Interesting. And so the other part of this fetal alcohol syndrome is you have sometimes a failure to thrive, your cognitive development is thrown off a little bit, you're slower to talk, slower to walk, and all of this from somebody who was abusing the partner while she was pregnant. It's amazing. So this is what you've got for kids. Diarrhea is a real big problem. There's an irritable bowel thing that kind of goes on with kids that develops in the fetus when they're under a lot of anxiety. Okay, and a lot of stress, the cortisol levels go up. And that's what happens. Now, does every baby who has diarrhea, does that mean their mother was beaten? Oh no, it does not. But when you start, you look at it as a unit. And when you start seeing one thing, you start looking at other things, all right? So that's what you see in little babies. So this is preschoolers. I was amazed at the ADHD mention, and I've got some more statistics on that. But would you have ever thought that domestic violence in the family was gonna influence the severity of ADHD? I never did until I found this research. It was kind of amazing. Conduct disorder goes along with ADHD, okay, and it's childhood onset. Um, you can start to measure PTSD in preschoolers and school-age kids. I don't know if you can measure it in an infant, but if you could, I'd be willing to bet that it exists on some level. All right, they're whiny, they're clingy, they don't want mama to leave them, or you know, they're afraid that mama's never gonna come back when she does leave. There's this huge separation anxiety. And part of it is uh, just an attachment issue that comes up as infants. If you're a mom and you're so busy trying to survive that you don't have time to really care for your baby, you know, there's an attachment disorder that comes up. And it follows this kid into preschool, elementary school, and all the way up to adulthood. All right, um, they have a little trouble interacting with peers. These might be the kids who are mirroring what they see at home, so they hit and they bite, okay? Bless their hearts, that's, they're mirroring what they see, okay? And um, my, my uh, grandson was a biter. There was no abuse in his home, but he did like to bite, you know? But uh, I broke him of that, I bit him back, you know? So anyway, he doesn't bite me anymore. Okay, um, they're really ambivalent about a relationship with mom because if I can't trust you to protect me and to control what's going on in the house, I don't even really know how close I want to get to you. So these are kids that withdraw from their own mothers, okay? On the other side of that, they could be really, really eager to please. Please, mommy, anything you want. Please don't be mad at me. I'll be a good girl. I love you, mommy. You know, and that's what they do. They're really, really eager to please. Or they're the kids who are really hostile. I had a sister like that. She was the hostile one. She didn't care what anybody said. You know, I think she's still hostile. But just kidding. Um, but so you have both ends of the spectrum with kids, all right? Okay, so now you're going to look at teens and young adults. And remember, a lot of this is not addressed as the kids growing up. So it looks different at different developmental stages, and it's called something different at a different developmental stage, but it's still that progression. If this child stays in this violent home from infancy to teenage years, 
you have all of this stuff following them the entire time. Dating violence, the, the chances that a teenager will go through dating violence if she's living in a violent home is significantly higher. Delinquency, maybe nobody's watching if I go to school or not. Maybe I'm too embarrassed to go to school because I don't have clean clothes. Maybe we don't have a washer and dryer. I might have the black eye, okay? And there's lots of reasons kids don't go to school besides they just don't want to go to school. Um, substance abuse, I'm sure you can imagine the chances that some teenager is going to start to abuse substances with all of this going on at home is significantly higher. Alcohol especially because it's really kind of easy to get. It's probably in the house. Okay, so you just sneak it here and there. You know, you add some water to the bottle, you know, so nobody knows you've been in there, you know. Um, Pro-violent attitudes, especially boys. If they see it at home, they figure it's okay, nobody's stopping it, nobody's saying anything about it. I guess this is how you treat a woman. Okay? Conduct disorder, and this is adolescent onset. All right, aggression. Oh, I put aggression in there twice. Well, it's very important, so it's up there twice. Aggression, aggression. Okay. All right, so let's look at PTSD a little bit. Right, more than half of school-age kids in domestic violence shelters have really clinical signs of uh, levels of anxiety and PTSD. And there was a really great study done. Um, some researchers went in and they went into three different domestic violence shelters that had a you know, pretty large population all the time. And so they looked at the kids. It was amazing the, the levels of anxiety and PTSD in these children. There was hardly one that they did the, an assessment for that didn't show some signs of it. Okay, um, without some treatment, the kids have a really significant risk at delinquency, substance abuse, school dropout. Okay, um, what else? Hmm. Look at the last one. Individuals with PTSD may organize their lives around their own trauma. So what do you think that means? You organize your life around your trauma. Well, really what it means is your trauma becomes your entire life. Okay, I do this because of what my dad's going to do. I do this because of what might happen if I don't do this. I'm anxious all the time, so I might not see my friends. It's just that everything that you do revolves around how you are reacting to the traumatic event in your life. That is an incredible way to live your life, especially if you're a kid. It's a hard way if you're an adult. But it's even more difficult if you're a kid because you don't know how to process it. If you're 13 years old, how do you process something like that? You know? Okay, so suicide. Okay, it's suicide's relatively rare in kids under 12, although it is becoming more um, well, more common. I hate to use the word common, but it's happening more and more. Um, they, they get when kids get upset, they're really impulsive, aren't they? They get angry, they're impulsive, especially boys. And they may just, if you're 12 years old, you're going to figure out a way. You might even ask for help figuring out a way, and you just do it. One day you're here, and one day you're gone. Okay? Uh, girls are more likely to attempt it. Boys are more likely to actually complete it, which means they're going to succeed more often than girls, but girls are going to try it. Okay? All right. Um, children with a family history of violence, it's all underlined in yellow, okay? are more likely to cause suicide than kids that don't have that in the home. Okay, I was suicidal for a while. It didn't last long. I got help. But all of this stuff that's up here, I probably did at some point. All right, And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't have to mark the rest of your life. You go on and you get on with your life and then you get to talk about it. You know, and educate other people about what it really means. Okay, teen dating violence. It's exactly the same dynamics as adult relationships. It just looks different because the people are younger. The highest rates are between the ages of 16 and 19. Well, you're going to be dating between 16 and 19, although I hear that kids are dating at 12 now. It's true, huh? 10? No, no, that's not dating. That's just going to the playground. No, 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 no. No, really. Oh, my grandson's nine. I'm not happy with that. Okay, so kids are really dating at 12? I need to get a life here. Okay, um, one in five female high school students reported physical or sexual violence during a date. One in five, y'all. If you look at the number of girls in your child's high school class, do a one in five 
mathematical gymnastics kind of exercise and you're going to come up with how many girls in that class are going through this. And it's pretty pretty reliable statistic because I do that. You know, I look at numbers and, and look at circumstances I'm in and it, it's pretty reliable. And I go by what girls come up and talk to me about when they're, they're done with their seminar. Um, look at this. In, okay, 2,000 kids, all right, eighth and ninth grade, 35 and a half percent reported dating violence. Okay, 35, that's like one out of three, maybe one, one in three and a half. Okay, uh, let's see, eight to nine percent are more likely to attempt suicide. If you're experiencing dating violence abuse, eight to nine percent are more likely to attempt suicide. Wow. All right, so here's some warning signs of teen dating violence, okay? Um, it looks a lot like adult violence, but it's a little bit different, again, because they're kids. There's this huge pressure to date me and only me. You know you want me, baby. You know you do. I'm like, you know, I'm on the football team or whatever. I've got the cool car, the cool phone, the cool whatever. And it's not so much that the girl wants him, he wants her. And she's going to be the target, and she is going to be the one he goes after. Just like adults are going to claim love at first sight. I will never love anybody like you. You know, you're just the best ever, you know? It's always the way it is, and it's the same thing for adults. Um, I saw a, another lady do a presentation. In three minutes, she went through scenarios that had a grown man in the house moving in and setting up house with another woman within three days. Wow. Was he abusive? What do you think? Yep. Because any time you are rushed into a relationship, the rush is there for one reason. I need to control you. And I need to charm you really, really quick and get you under my control before you figure out who I am. Because once I've hooked you, it's a little bit easier for you to stay with me, isn't it? Yep. Okay, so this is all about rushing. Constantly texting or instant messaging. I mean, it's all the time. Okay. Calling you names. Mm, it's those lovely body part names, you know, that you hear around high school. All right. Touches you without permission. And that's not just sex. It's just like touching you, pulling on you constantly with my arm around your neck. I'm guiding you, telling you where to walk. It's like this constant touchy thing. All right. Telling you what to wear, who to talk to, how much makeup to wear, what kind of clubs you can join. Goes everywhere with you but the bathroom and would go there too if he could. Really. Goes home with you, goes to the ball game with you, to the mall to see your friend, you know, everywhere. Tries to turn you against your parents because really, why do we need parents? They're just going to tell you that you can't see me anyway, so you don't need them. All right. Breaks dates at the last minute. Mm, mm, mm. That's not even nice. Okay. Decides what clubs you can join. Okay. Because really, if you're a cheerleader and, you, and you're in the cheer squad, I might not want you there because other boys are going to be looking at you. Okay, and that's just how convoluted the thinking gets. Okay, so here's a teenage bill of rights. Every teenage girl who comes to see me gets this. And I'm like, you post this on the mirror in your bedroom or your bathroom and you read it every single morning. And most of them do. Most of them like having it hanging up there. But it's this constant reminder that even if you're not in a violent relationship yet, these are things you always have a right to ask for. Just because you're a human being and you're here on this earth, you have a right to these things. It's about honesty and trust. It's about feeling safe. It's about the right to say no when you want to say no without feeling guilty. All right? And the one at the bottom, which really should be at the top, the right to end the relationship. Okay, the right to say it's over, dude. Okay, so if you're an adult, this is what it grows up to be. You've lived with this your entire life, and when you're an adult, you've got adult depression. Okay, Adult anxiety goes in there. You've got trauma symptoms. You might have a hard time sleeping. You might have an eating disorder. You might have a substance disorder. Um, all kinds of stuff that go with that. You also have an increased tolerance for violence in your relationship. I grew up with it. It must be okay. That's what the mamas say to their kids, right? I grew up with it. Deal with it. You'll be fine. Just do what he wants. Okay? All right, 
Um, this is just some more symptoms that maybe the kids who are exposed to domestic violence are going to have. Um, we're not really going to go through them too much because we've already done most of it. Sleeplessness, though, is a really big deal. You, how many people have ever had their kids in the bed because, like, they don't want to sleep in their own bed? There's monsters in the closet. Okay, kids go through that. But what you're looking at is the kid who is quite suddenly afraid to sleep in the bed. Okay, I need to be by mama, and some of that comes from I need to protect mama. And daddy never seems to get as mad if I'm there, so I need to be with you all the time. And that includes when you go to sleep at night. Um, headaches, stomach aches, um, let's see, bedwetting. It's regressive behavior. When kids are under a lot of anxiety and stress, they go back to being an infant. They might start wetting the bed when they have been potty trained. They might start sucking their thumb. Um, they might start having temper tantrums. You know, all those things that are just a little bit regressive. And it's all about not knowing what else to do. You know, I can't cope, so I'm just going to go back to when I was a kid and things were a little bit nicer then. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions about anything up here? Yes, ma'am. Oh, parentification. Okay, this is all about, and this is great. That's what I did, okay, because I was the oldest, and I became the parent. When my mom wasn't there, I was in charge. Okay, and my mom worked two jobs to, to support us because my dad didn't work, he couldn't work. So, um, so when my sisters got home from school, I made sure they did their homework. I cooked dinner. I made sure they got to bed on time, made sure they got their bath. And I often took babysitting jobs in the evening, so whoever didn't want to stay home came with me, okay? And I talked to my mom about what was going on, you know? So it's very, very stressful on a kid because I need my mom to take care of me, and I'm suddenly the one taking care of my sisters and my mom. Okay, so that's what parentification is, okay? And that's a really, really hard job for a kid. Okay, so there's some health-related issues. We're just going to touch on this very briefly. Most of these kids are in just average to, to, um, to poor health, about twice as often as other kids. Okay, and there's a, one really good reason for that is if there is violence going on in the home, how likely is it do you think that abusive partner is going to let mom take the kids to the doctor? Yeah, but, and why do you think? What's that? They might tell the doctor something. What if that kid was injured by the dad? Okay? You know, you're not going to take the kid in to see the doctor. Or the abuser's not going to want you to take him in because, oh, then who's involved? OCS and the courts. And suddenly somebody's in all of our business. And, and so then it's just a big mess. And often the moms will just say, you know what, look, it's not worth it. I'll do the best I can. And the kids don't get to the doctor unless it's really like this life-threatening thing. All right, they have higher rates of low birth weight, okay? Um, one of the best ways to control somebody is to control what they can eat or drink. And that's one of the most abusive patterns that uh, an, a, a couple can fall into. The abuser decides when you can eat and drink, okay? And if you don't behave yourself, you may not get to eat today. Well, what if you're pregnant? And you need to eat, and you need your fluids, you need, you need everything. You might need pickles and ice cream, okay? So if you're not allowed to eat, that baby's going to be low birth weight, right? The anxiety and stress, the increased cortisol levels in you because you're more anxious, that can all contribute to low birth weights in that baby. Um, acute illnesses, okay, not the chronic stuff, but just the stuff that just, it comes up, it flares up real quickly, and then it goes away. They're always doing that. They're six times more stammering. Okay, now, I read this and I put it in here. I couldn't find any research why that's true. If y'all find something, let me know. But apparently, there is more stammering, okay? They go hungry twice as often, okay? And they're more likely to, less likely to be taken for medical care, all right? So here's what, um, oops. Okay, um, so here's how the kids respond, okay? And the response to it really, really depends on a lot of things. And the response is from either really maladaptive to they're doing so great you couldn't even believe it, okay? And here's all the reasons why, all right? So there's some moderating factors for this. The nature of the violence. If the kid thinks that what's going on in the house is their fault, then the effect on them is going to be much more severe. But I bet that makes sense, doesn't it? Okay? Um, if they don't see healthy conflict resolution, 
they're not going to adapt as well to when there's conflicts with other people. I run from conflict. I still don't do conflict well. I really, really don't. And I'm 55. I need to learn. But I haven't learned it yet. Okay, how often this violence occurs. Okay, if I see a violent episode one time in a year, that's a lot different from seeing it one time in an hour, isn't it? Okay, so my exposure is really, really um, going to depend on how well I cope, okay? Um, there's this thing called emotion-focused strategies. And what that means is the way I cope and the way I deal with my life is purely based on a reaction to what's going on in front of me. It's not based on planning or problem solving. Does that make sense? It's like constant trauma. Um, let's imagine you're in a car wreck. Not really, but let's imagine. And if you've ever been in one, you know immediately after the wreck, you're really not sure what to do, so you just do anything to show that you're doing something. Well, that's what kids do. They're not really sure how to cope with it, so they just do whatever. Okay? Um, the age of the child, the younger the kids are, when they start to see violence in the home, the more severe the, the stress and the emotional and psychological effects are going to be. Okay? Because at two, you don't understand at all what's going on. You just know that something is scary. At 18, you completely get it. You might even be able to process it enough to where you're not completely traumatized by it. Okay? Um, we kind of went over the time since the last exposure. The boys react a whole lot differently. When boys react to this, they're going to be the ones to have the externalized behavior, which just means I'm going to go out and fight with my friends. I might turn into the schoolyard bully. I might even try to take dad out next time he touches mom. What the girls do is we get depressed. I love women. I love women. I'm one of them. But you know what we do? We get depressed and anxious, and what do we do? We just get all in here. You know, we turn it on ourselves. We either eat too much, or we drink too much, or we shop too much. Okay? I love to return things. I shop and I return. You know, I, hey, you know. But we do. We turn it in on ourselves. It's like we get mad at us because we're going through tr stress and trauma. Okay? And then the presence of child abuse. Uh, what is the number? Hmm. It's about 45 to 50 percent of the time a man who abuses his partner will eventually at some point abuse that child. Okay, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. They will eventually about 45 to 50 percent of the time. All right, so how do you parent if you live in an abusive household? Well, I have a couple of words. It's very difficult. All right. So, this is if you're the victim, how do you parent? You've got a really high stress level, okay, from the abuse. You have an abuser telling you, you're a bad mother, you never were a good mother, I never wanted those kids anyway because I knew you'd be a bad mother. And so that's a real hit to your self-esteem. And so what happens? You're not parenting very well because you've got somebody over here who's undermining you because they think you're a bad parent. Okay, they're really, really preoccupied with surviving. If I'm trying to survive, I don't have a lot of time to be maybe even giving you a bath and feeding you, much less being the Girl Scout mom, you know? So it, there's a real compromise there. Um, the victims are really, really often trying to avoid those physical attacks. And when they're trying to avoid the physical attacks, they might miss something, you know, in a move or something, and they wind up uh, injuring their own child. Okay, so it's all about trying to protect me so I can then protect you. And in the end, very often what happens is everybody's injured. All right. Um, the last one here is I have, I do some training with OCS because I get a lot of referrals from, from moms who have supposedly started abusing their children. Okay, well, in their eyes it is abuse. And here's what's happening. These are women who are going through violence in their own homes from their partner. They reach a point where they're frustrated, tired, they're overwhelmed, they're aggravated, and the first thing that comes out is you got a hand and you're smacking the kid. Okay? It happens. We all reach a point. That's what the moms do, and they do it more than once, and so they turn into an abusive parent. These are not moms who, attend, who intend to abuse their kids. These are moms who are overwhelmed and need some help to cope, and they wind up injuring their children. Does that, I hope that makes sense. You know, I'm, I'm trying to explain this. And, and so I've done some training with OCS so they can recognize when these moms are getting overwhelmed with what they've got to deal with. Okay? All right. 
Um, <laughs> here it is. Most victims of violence are not bad parents, but domestic violence is a severe stressor and it really does impact their ability to be a good parent. Okay. Um, how the victims protect themselves and their kids. They just do whatever they're told to do. You want me to be up at 2 o'clock in the morning to make you bacon and eggs? I'll do it. You want me to wash your clothes at 5 o'clock? I'll do it. I'll do whatever it takes. They just deny it. They refuse help. They do whatever they need to do to stay safe so they can protect their children. They lie. They manipulate. It's not because they're liars and manipulators, but when you've been in a relationship for so long and you don't know what to expect, and you don't know if what you're doing is going to be okay or right or acceptable, you just lie. You lie to protect yourself and to stay safe. Okay? You self-medicate. Oh my goodness, that's when the pills and the alcohol and the shopping and the chocolate and everything else comes out. It's a way to cope. You adapt. You just, you go into this place where you just decide that what I have is what I have and it's just going to have to be okay and I'm just going to deal with it. And the, the part about that is that the women stop looking for help. They stop looking for a way out and they take it and after a while it gets to be too much and they leave very quickly sometimes without a safety plan and the safety plan is just all about keeping everybody alive okay and then the moms wind up in a bad place and this thing here weighing perpetrator generated risk against life generated risk what do you think that's about what is that oh say that again that's my favorite saying Yeah, I know what's going to happen with you, buddy, the one who's abusing me, but when I leave or if I make another choice, I have no idea what's going to happen. And that's exactly what these ladies tell me. And I've had more than one woman tell me, honey, the devil I knew was better than the one I didn't know, so I stayed right where I was. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly it. It's really, really easy to say she could leave anytime she wanted to, but the truth <laughs> is it's just not that easy. Okay, so the perpetrator is a parent. Um, some of them, some abusers are really good parents and some are not. Okay, because remember, this abuse is targeted at one person and one person only. And that's their partner. This is, you know, I might, if I was a, a, a perpetrator, I don't need to control my dad. I don't need to control my mother. I don't even need to control my sister. You, partner, I need to control. So they're great sons, they're great friends, they're great fathers, but to this one person, they're not so great. They undermine, they neglect, manip they manipulate, and often they're very, very self-centered. Okay. So this is what the kids think of the perpetrators. On one hand, I'm afraid of you, and on the other hand, I love you with all my heart, and I just want you to be a good dad. Okay, so lots of different things go on. You're anxious, you're scared, you're angry, you're, you have affection, you have loyalty, and you just wish that that guy would leave the house. And all of that is wrapped up into one little tiny person, and it's really, really hard to help them figure out what it is that they're feeling. And they're more often, when they have all of this going on, these kids are more often to express anger towards the mother. <coughs> Because once you get old enough and you can start to figure out that maybe something could be done to get us out of this and mom's not doing anything, it's really, really easy to get angry. Um, the kids often crave a connection for that battering parent. And that's why we have safe visitation centers. You know, the judge is going to award a supervised visitation and the kids love it. They do because they can see dad now in a safe environment. I can connect with you. And actually, the, at our Safe Visitation Center, we have some great visits. You know, the kids are happy to be in a safe place where they can, can visit. Okay. All right. Um, there's some assessments that we do when our kids come in. And the biggest challenge is just deciding where there is domestic violence. Okay. Um, a lot of times it's hidden, and a lot of times kids get really inappropriate or ineffective or at some point unsafe help because the right assessment isn't done, okay? Because what goes along with help and therapy is a safety plan, okay? Because if the perpetrator gets wind that there's help being given to other members of the family, 
and he's not ready for that relationship to be over, it can be very, very dangerous. Okay, um, so we're not gonna do that a whole lot. Uh, so when assessments lead to OCS reports, all right, we have to make reports. I mean, one our first goal is the safety of the child, so we have to make them. But this is one time, if we're dealing with a battered woman, we have to let her know that we're making a report. I know we don't have to, we don't. We don't have to say a word, but we do, and here's why. There's much more fear of greater harm when OCS shows up. Okay, the, the perpetrator might be really, really nice and agreeable and, and helpful when the OCS worker is there, but as soon as that worker leaves, things could get very dangerous. Okay, she's also worried about a custody battle. All right, and she also might not make a report because she's, you know, she firmly believes in her heart that her child needs this father. You know, and so she's not going to do a whole lot to further that process because she wants the father around and financial support. Um, the other thing we tell folks is father report against the abusive parent, not against the mother. Okay, and what happens more often than not is the abusive partner will file the report with OCS first. And then once that's done, it's really, really tricky to get it all figured out because now mom's a perpetrator. Okay. And I'm working with a lady right now. She finally got her kid back, her kids back after nine months because her partner had filed the first report. She had to come to me for parenting classes and understanding domestic violence and all of this stuff. This woman was fine. She got it. She totally got it. But he filed the report first. So she had to go through all of this stuff with me. Okay. All right. So there's some intervention that we go through when we start filing with OCS. This is what we do. We just give the mom a safe place to talk. We help her and the kids break that conspiracy of just keeping everything quiet because it really is a conspiracy. Okay? The moms tell the kids, don't talk about this. And the kids are agreeing, and the older kids are telling the younger kids, hey, mommy said we can't talk about this to anybody. Okay? So when you go in to see the therapist, don't say anything. Okay, as a therapist, can I tell you how crazy that drives me? You know, because I know before the kids even come in the room what mom has told them. Don't say anything. And as somebody who's already been there, I get that part too. So, um, just a sense of isolation. We really, really, really work with the moms to, to break that isolation. We help her get to support groups. We help get her hooked up with other parents who are going through this. And so she no longer feels like she's alone. You know, because that's the first place you go in your mind is, I must be the only one in the world who's going through this. And they, they really feel isolated. You look at the kids' skills and their talents and you help promote that, okay? And then you just support the caregivers. Um, here's some promising practices I found. A really fancy little term, cross-system dialogue. I had to really figure what, out what that meant. And the only thing that that meant was different agencies working together to help do the very best we can for kids. And what that includes is the domestic violence agencies, child welfare, and the court systems. Okay, getting all these people together to talk, to say, hey, this is what we see. How about if we try this to support these families? Okay, and there's always conflict, isn't there? Always, always, because we're all dealing with the same kind of money. At least if you're in uh, social service, we all want the same money. So, just it's all about improving your communication and looking for a structure you can work in. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to skip through the rest of collaboration because I think I'm just about out of time because I'm really long-winded. Okay. So at the end of the day, it's all about helping hurting families. Yay! You guys are wonderful. Okay. All righty. I, I would add to what Pam just said, and I'm going to steal your word, Susan, back in the back. Spent 17 years with a battered women's program. But um, from her perspective, it helped me understand it. She said, you don't see batterers be usually beating their wives in public. They wait till a private moment. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of control over mm -hmm. that anger when they choose to release it. So yep. they don't have a problem. Um, with impulse control and managing the anger, they choose when to unleash that mm -hmm. violence into the woman. So, yeah, that's a very good point. Yep, very good point.